Welcome to the Town and Country Podcast, two churches, one ministry. You are here with us again, and we are thankful that you chose to be with us today. I am your host, Jonathan Illion, and here we are once again with Pastor Kevin Richter, who is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran in Rhinebeck, Iowa. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. And we also have with us again, Pastor Gerald Kapanka, who is a pastor at the Emanuel Lutheran in Cedar Falls, Iowa. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, John. All right. So did you guys have a good Memorial Day? Yeah. Did you eat too much? Uh, not that bad. I did. I kind of restrained myself. Okay. Well, the church potluck was probably where I ate the most. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. that's, that, that, those always tend to do it. So as our listeners may know, we are running two separate podcasts at the same time. Our first topic is Living Lutheran, and then alternating every other week after that is our topic of Ask the Pastors. So remember that for that second topic of Ask the Pastors, we're asking you to send in your questions to podcast at emmanuelcf with your uh, cf.com with your questions and we might just choose your question to talk about during our podcast again let's clarify that it's podcast at emmanuelcf.com podcast at emmanuelcf.com okay now because i screwed it up the first time let's make sure i get it right those times so all right So our topic for this podcast session is Living Lutheran. So our main focus is to bring the small catechism to a practical level, something that we can use every day. And so this time we are focusing on the first commandment. So Pastor Kevin, what do you have for us today? Well, we'll just start by uh, reading it from the small catechism. You shall have no other gods. And then Luther asks, what does this mean? We are to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And so, you know, just real quick, start with, you know, what is the primary focus of this commandment is to define what is a God. And really in the large catechism, Luther dives in much deeper um, to really talk about what is a God. And he says, you know, it's really easy to figure out what a God is or who your God is because you you look for three things. Um where does all good come from? What do you trust in in times of trouble? And what do you look to as the, the ultimate source of power? You know, And so these are the three things that we look to to be a God. And so ultimately, you know, this commandment, just when you put those two together, the, the first, the small catechism, the large catechism, everybody has a God. Even atheists have a God because there is something in their life that they look to for good that they trust in in times of trouble and that they believe is the highest source of power. It may be science, it may be uh, the cosmos, it may be money or power or their own intellect. Whatever it is, every single person walking this earth has a God in that definition. And so the first commandment is just simply saying, whatever your God is, make sure it's the one true God. Make sure it is the God of the Bible who is actually God who gives all good, who is our help in times of trouble, and who is the ultimate source of power because he is the creator of all things. So, you know, what is a God? And everybody has a God. And to that degree, we could even take it that every single Christian also has false gods that they allow to slip in. And, and I think that's, that's the important thing is that we make that distinction. One of the challenges that we have in today's world is especially as we're moving into a post-Christian culture, as I think our society and our culture wants to put God in a box. We want to narrow God into a a finite definition of God is that which you do on Sunday morning, that which takes place in your worship service, that which takes place perhaps in your devotional time. And if we can narrowly define God to to that divine being that that we, uh, we... gathered together to worship, or that's found only in your Bible, um, then anything else is fair game. Um, And that's the challenge I think our our people have today, is that when we think of God, we can only think of that which we pray to, or that which we give our money to, our service to, um, without thinking of all those things that we put our trust and our heart in, that we put our hope in our... um, And when we we, uh, narrow God down in that way, when we put him in that box we really do end up misunderstanding the first commandment and breaking that first commandment by narrowing in such a way um, that we make other things gods without even realizing it. Yeah. 
And I think one of the most helpful things I ever did went through was uh, Chip Ingram's Bible study, Real God. And he talks about when you picture God, what do you picture in your head? You know, what's the image that comes to mind? Yeah. And Charlton now, Heston and he, Moses. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know. <laughs> is it a, a white bearded guy in the clouds? Is it the Jesus as the shepherd carrying the sheep? Is it, you know, what what is your God that you just, this image of God that you have? And then is that based on Scripture? And is it based on all of Scripture? Or do we pick just single points of Scripture that I like Jesus as the good shepherd, so I deal with Jesus as the angry God driving out the you know money changers out of the temple, or I don't want to deal with the God of the Old Testament who would tell his people to kill other people, so I'm just going to focus on the good shepherd Jesus, and that's my God, and that's who I'll worship, not having a holistic picture of who God is, that yes, he is good, and that's where my good comes from, but also, he is the ultimate source of power, and he has the power to do whatever he wants, and I have to be okay with that, you know? And so, yeah, that's that buffet idea of God. I can pick yeah. and choose the parts of God I want. Um, and, and just the only parts that make me comfortable, you know, yeah. and, and give me something, you know? And, and that's the other part is we can turn God into a, a vending machine. You know, if I push this button, you give me this. If I do that, you know, if I go pray this, you'll, you'll dump out this for me, you know? And, and so all of those things are kind of misuses of God because we have to have this holistic picture of God is over all things in all the universe, but especially over all things in our life, you know, and has to be, uh, we have to have that trust, that love, that fear in every aspect of our entire life of who God is based on all of Scripture. And so, you know, it's really starting to, in a practical sense, reading this, we want to make sure that we have God as God, the true God, the whole God of the Bible, as our God of our whole life. And really, this is where, you know, Proverbs says, fear of God is beginning of wisdom. You know, and so when we talk about that fear God, because love God, trust in God, those are easy. We know what it means to love God. We know what it means to trust in God. But that one that trips up most people is fear, right? You know, like, why should I have to be afraid of God? I don't want to be afraid of God. Well, to fear God doesn't mean to be afraid of God. To fear God means you have a, a healthy respect, a reverence for who he is that you acknowledge he is God and I am not. You know, and so a lot of times I, I compare this to, you know, a relationship with your father. If you had the type of father who was stern and the disciplinary one but still loved you, that, you know, like when you do something wrong and you've been caught, you're a little scared to tell dad that you've <laughs> yeah. messed up because you know he could punish you even worse than the consequences you're already facing. But you also still go tell dad because you you trust that he is going to continue to love you and forgive you even in, in his disciplinary action, you know. And so it's just that healthy amount of he's God, he's bigger than me, he can do whatever he wants to me, <laughs> but I also know he, he is a loving, kind God. And that's where we have to look at all of Scripture to see that he is a God of wrath and just uh, a punishment for those who do not, you know, obey his word but he's also the God of forgiveness, uh, the God who sent his son to die for us, you know, and so keeping all of those things in together of who God is and that he's God and I'm not, that his will is the one I should obey, not my own, that he gets to say what's right and wrong, not me. That's the beginning of wisdom, because now when we can actually see God is God and I am not, and I have this healthy understanding and this proper placement of, of who is who, now I can start to discern what is God's will. How do I apply that to my life? How do I put that over my whole life? And that is wisdom that we can actually live out. You, you, you're talking about the fear God as, as your father, as, as we have that healthy respect. And it made me think of a, an illustration from my own life of fearing my father and, and trusting him. And, and I hope if I can tell this story, it doesn't get too far afield. I'm just learning to drive. And growing up in Michigan, we had a single car garage and a single car driveway. Um, and so we'd have to park one of our cars in the median, that, that part between the grass, between the sidewalk and the road, and the other car in the driveway. And so my mom had asked me to, to go out get a gallon of milk in the middle of winter. So I was backing the car out for the very first time. And my dad had said, hey, be careful when you back the car out because the other car is parked in this median. And I said, oh, dad, I've, I've been driving now for a whole month. I'm, <laughs> I certainly can do this. So I, I back the car out, and as happens in Michigan in the middle of winter, you, sometimes you get a little bit of snow backed up, and so I hit this pile of snow on our driveway, and they taught me to drive. When you hit a little snow, you can pull forward and back up a little bit and pull forward, and, and I kept 
getting through the snow and I couldn't get through the snow pile in the middle of our driveway. Um, and so I went back and forward and back and forward three or four times until about the fifth time it dawned on me that it wasn't snow that it was hitting. It was the other car. <laughs> You're just and, ramming and, it over and over and, again. And, <laughs> like, and not only had rammed it, I had pushed it out into the road. Oh, nice. And then it, when it dawned on me, I'd looked up and there was my dad standing in the picture window watching this entire episode. <laughs> the one who had just said, be careful when you backed out. And I had arrogantly said, I've been driving for a month. And now I'm so terrified of the fact that I had just done this. I put the car in reverse and went and just drove off with just complete fear and trepidation because of the wrath of my father. Got the gallon of milk, and I don't know if, if I had the possibility of running away in that moment, I may have. <laughs> but I came back home, and, and I knew the world was about to end. I was going to lose my license. I'd probably never drive again. And I went back in, and, and truly in, in a fatherly love and fear and trepidation, my dad looked at me and said, I guess you won't do that again. Yeah. And, and that was the image of fear, love, and trust God. Yeah. Um, and, and I will never forget that, but that's the image I have when I think of that's how we fear God. The wrath of God is there. He could have come down on me, but he knew my guilt and shame. He knew my repentance and sorrow. But rather than meeting out that wrath that I deserved, he said, I guess we'll never do that again. <laughs> yeah. He knew the law was already working on you, so it oh, showed yeah. a lot of mercy. And... I, I think it may have been the tears <laughs> running down my cheeks at that moment or, or my absolute defeated nature. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I mean, so, you know, that is the image of God, that we, we have this healthy fear that knowing I'm bringing my sin to a holy God. You know, and Bonhoeffer talks about this in, in his Christian fellowship book, Life Together, you know, that... Yeah. Um, if you are more scared to go to a fellow human being and ask for forgiveness than you are to God and ask for forgiveness, there's something wrong there. Because, you know, from sinner to sinner, we should expect forgiveness. From a sinner to a perfectly holy God, there is no reason for him to actually forgive us other than his love, grace, and mercy on us, you know? And so... Um, you know, that it, it, we should have a little bit of that. I'm scared to take my sin to God. And yet immediately met with the gospel of, I'm not scared to take my sin to God because I know who my God is. I know he's the God who's already paid for that sin. I know he's the God that promises forgiveness. And so holding those things in tension, you know, we don't just lose all fear of God that we just treat him with no respect or reverence of, ah, yeah, he'll forgive me. I can do whatever I want and he'll forgive me. You know, we don't want to lose that, but we also don't want to live in that fear of I'm going to hold my sin in because I don't want to take it to God because he is a holy God and he won't forgive me, you know? And so it's whole, it, it's in the tension of, I have this healthy respect and fear, but I also know who my God is and I know he's a loving God. And that's the beautiful nature of the objective reality of our sacraments. Um, that objective reality that I am baptized where he did say, I will never forsake you. Yep. I will never, even when you sin again, even when you smash the car into the middle <laughs> of the road and drive away like you own the place that he continues to love us, that we can come to him in our sin, and he says, you'll never do that again. Yeah. <laughs> You've learned your lesson. So I have a question for you both. If, if someone does have that perspective of God and they've got it wrong, they've got it, um, they've misunderstood what they are supposed to be using that first commandment for, what... Um, how do they know if they got it wrong? And then what do they do about it? How do they, how do they fix that problem? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you really just got to reflect and examine, again, what is that image of God? What do you think about God? When you think of God, what is it? it and then really, you know, does that my belief of God really impact my whole life? Or does that my, my view of God only impact my worship, my devotion? These, you know, uh, that's the waffle pancake thing, you know, like, a waffle has all the neat little compartments and you can pour syrup in this one and this one and not this one over here. You know, is that how you're treating God? That God's allowed in this space, I'll believe him in this space, but not over here. He's not allowed over there. You know, or is it a pancake where you just dump the syrup on and he runs over everything, you know? And you realize I haven't had breakfast yet. Yeah. And now I'm making you hungry, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, this is a problem, so. <laughs> But, you know, like, you know, I mean, it's so easy to turn it into a waffle and only put God here and, you know, I'll, I'll treat God here, I'll worship God here, I'll, I'll, but this over here, that's my time away from God. You know, that's my place where God doesn't get to tell me what I do and don't do, you know? And again, I, I would really challenge you to reflect on your image of God, your beliefs of God, is it based on the Bible and Scripture? Can you actually pull out Scripture verses that would 
make that image accurate, or is it just this is what I want my God to be? Mm-hmm. You know, because it's so easy for us as sinful natures to say, I want God to look like this. Right. Yeah. And so that's who I believe God is, rather than going to his word and saying, No, this is who God reveals himself to be. He tells me who he is, and I have to be okay with that. Mm-hmm. I make God in my image versus right. being made in the image of God. Right. right. Yeah. And and we can do that even, you know, with people that yeah. my memory of my grandpa can actually be what I wanted grandpa to be, not who grandpa actually was, you know. And so are we doing this with God, that we just kind of treat him as, this is who I want him to be, so this is who I'm going to think of him as? Or is it backed and based in Scripture? And that, you know, again, and it has to be the whole Scripture, all of it, you know, that we do find the wrath of God, and we're okay with that, but we also find the love of God and all of those things together. And I think we have an additional challenge, again, living in the post-Christian world, that we have, in the world that I grew up where even though we had different denominations and different understanding, we had a general concept of God in, in Christian culture. But that's radically changed in the last couple of decades, that today even Christians or so-called Christians see God very differently than the mm-hmm. biblical understanding of God, where you've got Christians who are saying, well, God is just this, uh, everybody love is love is love, and you can make God in your own image, and you can use this uh, smorgasbord or buffet-type God, and you pick and choose. And that's being preached in churches. Yeah. And so... If it makes you uncomfortable, it's not God. Right. You know, know, and and, God is what you make it. Yeah. Um, And so I think with our own members, to to your question, John, uh, we can't just simply say, well, what do you hear on your local TV station or your radio station or, or, or what do you hear around you? But you've got to go right back to what you said, Kevin. What is the word, say, what is found in the Scriptures? Because that's the only answer. You're not going to get it from the culture and society, uh, from the congregation that your your cousin goes to or the one that you hear on TV today, because those aren't the definitions of the God that, that the Bible gives to us. No, and so, I mean, I think really to your question, John, how do we answer this? How do you learn the true nature of any person? You have to have a relationship with them. You have to spend time with them. You have to see them on the good days and the bad days, see how they react, you know, and, and so... How do we know who God truly is? We spend time with him. You know, this is why it's so essential for Christians to be in the word, to be reading, not just for a, a head knowledge of now I know what the Bible says, but that I truly know who God is because I've seen him, I've spent time with him, I've learned his character, you know. And, and then as I continue to deepen that relationship and learn more about him, it will impact more of my life, you know, because of that relationship. And then I think the practical living from there is once you begin to have this beginning of wisdom, this healthy understanding of who God is based on the scriptures, not on our own wants, then you wake up every morning and start your day with him. You know, Bonhaver talks about starting every day with prayer to just remind yourself, God is with me the rest of the day. You know, everything I'm going to face, God is there. And, And how do I start that? By right away in the morning, first thing I do when I wake up is talk to him. Good morning, Lord. You know, I know you're with me today, and keeping that you are God, I am not, confessing my sin, I know I'm a sinner, I know you're a perfect holy God, I know if I were in control, I would mess it up immediately, but I'm thankful you're in control because you're a holy God, you know, and then spending time with him, you know, hey, let's go to devotion, you know, and so whether it's a morning devotion, noon devotion, it doesn't matter, but just spending time throughout the day with him, and just keeping that understanding that he is the syrup that runs over the whole pancake. There is no part of my life that I can say like, oh, I'm going to do this over here even though I know it, it's not pleasing to God. No, if I know that, I repent of that, I come back to that, and I let God be God and me be, you know, his child. Yeah. And, I, and I think that that is the, that is the challenge. Uh, I mean, I've been in the faith since I was born, and this is something that I struggle with uh, on a daily basis is is that knowledge you think you know God right oh I've been around God my whole life yeah okay fine but that's not a, that's not what we're talking about here you have to develop that understanding and that understanding only comes from your from your immersion into the Bible and and learning from others uh, listening to podcasts like this this is how we this is how we do it so and I think we see that probably, um, most borne out for us in times when life is hard. Yeah. Um, when when life is easy, when things are kind of going and flowing, and and you don't have challenges, it's easy to kind of make God in our own image. 
but as, as Luther describes for us in the large catechism, he says, you know, when, seek me when you suffer misfortunes and distress, crawl to me, cling to me. Um, if, if you've made God in your own image when, uh, when things are good, you can't come to him when things are tough because it's only what I, makes me feel good. And, and when I don't feel good, where do I go? Yeah. Um, and, and so that's the God that we need to, to know that I can go to you and depend on you when things are falling apart. When and, my life is upside down. And that was one of the points I was going to bring you up. You know, like football, we always said, you can't make a great play in the game if you don't make it in practice first. You know, you got to practice like you play. Yeah. And so, you know, the more we practice in times of strength, in times of good, to depend on God, to rely on God, then it just becomes instinct in those times when it's hard. You know, and so actually just a quick story that, you know, last week we had water in the basement and walked downstairs and boom, your feet are in water and start walking around. It's in every room and, you know, mind is just spinning about how much work this is going to be and calling church members, come over, help. And church secretary, bless her heart, she's later asking me, she said, okay, when you stepped into water, what was the first thing you did? And I said, oh, I started <laughs> investigating, you know, where is it? Where is it coming from? She said, no. And I said, well, I started, you know, and I just listed all the things I did. And finally she said, no, you prayed, right? And it's like, yeah, uh-huh, I did that, you know, like, <laughs> you know, sure. yeah, that, that should be our instinct, right? The moment we hit that, okay, God, I need you, uh, you know, yeah. I need you in this, and I really, I mean, that should be everything, because we need God in the good just as much as in the bad, but in those times of, if I was talking to God all morning already long when things are going well, the moment things go wrong, who am I going to turn to? God, you know, that's that practical living that we prepare ourselves, practice that, you know, have that lifestyle all the time so that when we hit those times we need God, that's the first thing we go to. And I think that is the comfort that people can get is the fact that even a pastor, even a man of God who who knows these things, the instinct is uh, to think about all this other stuff rather than just going back to God. And that was the first thing that I was thinking about when, if, if that would have happened to me, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have said, Oh God, help me here. No, I would have said, Oh geez, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to. So this is something that we all can grow and learn from. So thank you both for, uh, we're running up against the clock here, but thank you both for bringing that insight into the first commandment. Uh, I think this is what people need to hear and I appreciate you both being here. So um, once again, special thanks goes out to our audio engineer, Mr. Dave Kaler, for helping us to put on this wonderful podcast. Thank you for choosing to join us today for the Town & Country Podcast, Two Churches, One Ministry. We we want to remind you again to submit your questions for the Ask the Pastors topic to podcast at emmanuelcf.com so that we can answer those burning questions that you have about your Christian world today. So again, thank you, Pastor Kapanka, Pastor Kevin, for being with us. I am your host, Jonathan Illion, and we invite you to come back again next week as we bring you the next installment of the Town & Country Podcast. Thanks again and have a great week.